privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord. I love it because God can and will do anything. Anything. You can say what you want. I'm a Christian everywhere I go. Wherever I am, I know He's with me. I know I can touch Him when I'm all by myself, and I have. And I understand that this relationship has to be one-on-one. I get that. But don't you ever think for a second that special things don't happen when God's people come together with one purpose. It matters. It, there are things that can only happen between me and Jesus. But there are other things that all through the scripture in my life seem to only occur when we're together. And we don't have to choose. It's not this or that. Amen. It's this and that. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us at Longview First Church. And uh, we we hope that you're blessed while you're here. I I love it when I walk through the door on a Sunday morning. I know that I'm going to worship God. I have no idea what's going to happen beyond that. And I can't wait to see. But we're glad that you're here with us today. I'm glad that my my, my mother, my cousin Paul, are here today. And always a privilege to to get to hang out with my mom. My my in-laws were supposed to be here. He's been hospitalized in Good Shepherd. So they're they're just up the road. And, And I say that to say this I I know they have uh, uh, shared it and uh, 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 done their best to circulate it but you know uh, Daniel and Georgia uh, at five o'clock today in the old sanctuary or these these didn't exist when I was young they're they're having a gender reveal is that a party sir what what do we call that those didn't exist when I was having kids I've still got kids but you know we didn't have those. They're fairly new. The first one I ever went to was for Beck Harrington. When we, uh, I told him the other day, it's when we went to find out if he was like Beck or Becky. And, and we, uh, we were really excited there. So I don't know how these work, but you're invited. And I guess we'll find out if I'm going to be a grandpa or a grandma. I don't know, but it, it'll be great. <laughs> We don't ever call visitors names. All the statistics say that, that people don't like it. But I, I want to say how glad I am today to have my wife's cousin Brent here in service with us. And we were trying to figure out, the last time I saw you, you were teaching defensive driving in Beaumont. Comedy defensive driving. Because I was there one Saturday for a ticket I got during Hurricane Katrina in Mississippi. And I was there the next Saturday for a ticket I got in Texas coming back home. So however long ago Hurricane Katrina was, that's the last time I saw you. We're we're glad that you're here. If we're going to start calling names and I'm going to quit quickly, uh, I want to say, you know, how how thankful you are to have the Holmans in service with us. I think this is their third straight service now. And then the Osterhaus is glad to have them in service with us. And I'm going to quit. So, uh, amen. Ezra chapter number 10. Ezra chapter number 10 and verse 2. We use a variety of translations while teaching. I think a few Wednesdays ago, I read from nine different translations. I think, I think in in my years preaching, this is the first time I've ever taken my text uh, from not from the King James Version. This is from the New King James Version. And, And if that offends you, then stick around for 10 minutes. The next verse we read will be fine, I promise. Ezra chapter 10, verse 2. Shechaniah, the son of Jehu, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. We're really good at listing our issues. We're really good at taking stock of our land, our nation, our families, our lives. We do great with the negative. We're programmed for it. As a matter of fact, there are some people, and I'm not going to 
I'm not going to call any names that I'm convinced if I stood up here for the next 30 minutes and said the country and the world are just lost spiraling into hell in a handbasket and everybody's backslid and everybody's gone nuts. You catch me after church and say, Brother Moore, that was preaching. But if we try to say anything good at all, well, you know, I want to talk to us on a simple subject. We've got problems. There is hope in Israel in spite of this. I'm here today because of the hope that is in me. And I hope you're here today because the hope that is in you. And that hope doesn't come from Washington. It doesn't come from Austin. It doesn't come from this building. It doesn't come from our family. It doesn't come from our friends. And it doesn't come from our neighbors. The water that I give you will be in you a well springing up into everlasting life. Let's ask Him to help us today. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again. We pray right now that you just meet with us, be with us, lead us, and guide us in these next few minutes as only you can that we can leave here more like you than we are right now in Jesus name Amen Amen let's thank him together one more time <laughs> Hallelujah thank you Jesus you may be seated in western Europe in the tiny nation of Belgium stands a hill in the middle of miles and miles of flat plains it's not just any hill that hill is to commemorate where the battle of waterloo took place that man-made hill a mass of intentionally elevated earth stands above and looks down on that spot where the forces of great britain led by the duke of wellington dealt napoleon a decisive defeat to change the course of the history of europe and saved England from an invasion. As a matter of fact, they were not under serious invasion threat again until 1942. The hill is called the Lion's Mound. Because at the pinnacle stands a man-made bronze lion. Now tradition says that it was forged from uh, Napoleon's cannons that were taken captive. That is not true. What is true, however, is that giant statue of a lion is standing there snarling, an open-mouthed beast, symbolizing the courage of the armies that day. And all of Great Britain believed that they owed their freedom and everything they possessed to that particular group of soldiers. It would not be so again in England until World War I. But it was not uncommon if you read records for veterans who could prove from discharge papers that they had served at Waterloo to have legal uh, issues dismissed if they were small. It was the difference in job applications and even court cases. It mattered because they understood that they owed everything they had to a relative handful of men. Well, I read the account once of a man who visited that great monument and stood in awe and remarked that a bird had built its nest right in the midst of the lion's mouth. He said there in that open mouth with crafted fangs stood a nest of twigs and uh, lined with soft pieces of downy feathers and bits of cloth filled with chirping baby birds with their little heads sticking right out of the mouth of the lion and what a contrast of images it portrayed this ferocious beast and those singing baby birds you had a statue designed to commemorate the armies of freedom and specifically to inspire fear and in those who would threaten it in the future yet there in its mouth uh, 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 those baby birds a symbol of future hopes and dream hope embodied in feathers it brings to mind the, the poem that Emily Dickerson and pinned. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. It sings the tune without words and never stops at all. And the sweetest in gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb 
of me. Hope is so aptly described as a feathered thing that can fly out of and above circumstances and really does ask nothing in return. It's that irresistible and irrepressible bit of optimism that beats within the human heart. When we look around and can find no cause for it or no explanation for it, when we have every reason to feel differently, yet we find it within us. Hope yearns for and reaches for a better day in the worst of times. It's that undying and unyielding belief that in spite of what I'm facing and in spite of how I feel, in spite of what I've done, in spite of what's been done to me, victory in my life really can be snatched from the jaws of defeat. And as much as suffering and pain and loss are parcel and part of the human condition, hope is woven into the very fabric of our being. It's that audacious belief that's founded upon the goodness of God, not circumstances. The goodness of God, not attitude. The goodness of God, not outlook. And it is human to despair, but especially in the face of overwhelming circumstances. Yet when we grasp Him for who He is, it gives not just peace and not just direction, but hope to our lives. Now, stick with me. It was the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59 that said it like this Isaiah 59 verse number 1 Behold the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear that's the exact sentiment that the author found himself in the spirit of God moved upon him to pen our scripture text today the book of Ezra is written in a time when the Jews are returning from Babylonian exile. They have been exiled to Babylon for 70 years. For seven decades. Longer than Jack Manasco has been alive. 70 years. Now, I wish I had time to preach about their spirit going into captivity. That's not what today's lesson's about. Today is about their spirit coming out of captivity. But so famously on their way in in chains, on their way in with the temple sacked and their homes destroyed and the city wall torn down, when their best and brightest, their youngest, were taken away as captives, three different groups, three different mindsets within one congregation, three different mindsets developed in Babylon. On their way into chaos, on their way into a godless world, on their way into a city and kingdom so backward, God would use it to describe man-made false religion. And he would use it to describe the Antichrist man-made government. Babylon was bad. On their way in, these people who are leaving the land God had given their forefathers, the land that Abraham had walked from Ur of the Chaldees to claim and possess, now they're carried away in chains. And there arose three different groups within that one congregation. Now we're one church and we're one congregation today made up of hundreds of mindsets and opinions and ideas. But there are three spirits alive and well in our day as we ascend into what the Bible foretold. By the way, don't freak out when you see Bible prophecy being fulfilled. What did you think was going to happen what can we do to change it nothing honey it's the Bible what can you do while you live through it what can we do to further his purpose oh we don't have time for that some of you read left behind books you're not gonna kill anybody and change the prophetic plan of God you need to get your mind on him anyway another story three different groups arose the first ones were those guys who hung their harps by the willows they sat down and said, it's never going to be old time Pentecost again. We're gone from the temple. That building that my mama sold peanut brittle to put carpet in is gone. We can't sing the songs of Zion in a strange place. Now don't think I'm talking about music. I watched during worship service today when we're singing new songs and some people were reading the words while they sang. Then we switched to old songs and those people closed their eyes and the folks that have been singing the new songs stared at the screen so they could sing along. We got you covered. 
It's never going to be. What was it in the psalmist Merle Haggard? The good times are really over for good. It's never going to be like it was before. The best is behind us. They just hung their harps up and said, we're going to spend the rest of our days lamenting the state of the nation. We're going to spend the rest of our days lamenting the state of Israel. We're going to spend the rest of our days lamenting the state, the state of the church. You can whine and sob and cry until you die or Jesus comes, but you're not going to help anybody doing that, including you. <laughs> Say not that the former days are better than... The... Then he had another group. If you can't beat them, join them. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. We can eat what they eat. I mean, we lost the war. It's 2023. Everybody's doing it. We can drink the king's drink. We lost the war. It's 2023. Everybody's doing it. You, 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 can, you, can, you can pick your gender. You can decide if you're a human or an animal. You don't have to do all this old-fashioned crazy stuff or run around telling the truth. It's okay. We live in a world where gay people fought to get married and straight people just want to live together. And those are two separate issues. And you can pick on either one. But we got a problem going both directions. We are an immoral, upside-down, inside-out, godless generation. And we're not here to beat on neighbors. We don't do that. But there are churches in our world and in Texas that instead of running from that are leaning into that. That's where we're going. They did that. That was the biggest group in Babylon. They just blended in. So you've got the old timers who I'm just going to whine and, and, and eat sour cookies and lament about the good old days until, until I die and then I can be happy. Then you have the other group. Ah, if you can't beat them, join them. We're just going to be just like everybody else and stake out our part. And then you have that third group. It was tiny with names like Daniel and Meshach and Abednego and Shadrach. And they said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work. I'm going to have a career. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to try to change the country. I'm going to build a life for myself. But I'm not going to defile myself to do it. I can acknowledge that Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the land. But honey, John. Jehovah's the king of all things and I can do this and I can be his. I don't have to compromise to have a life. I don't have to compromise to have a career and I don't have to compromise to have a voice. We can't name a compromiser. We can't name the whiners who hung up their harps but those men are immortalized who said I'm going to live for him and I'm going to live amongst them. Your attitude in this end time matters. It matters. Now they're on their way out 70 years later. And the Daniels are dead and in the hands of God. The book of Ezra is written on this return from Israel. First Nehemiah and then Ezra, by the grace of God, are leading pilgrimages out of captivity and back into the land that God said was theirs. Seven decades gone. You would think... As strangers in a strange land, they would be anxious to return home. You would think, after hearing stories, they'd be anxious to get back. But unfortunately, history tells another story. Instead of this excitement in their personal exodus, there's a lot of apathy about leaving Babylon. Because these are descendants of the people who just blended in. Or wasted their days yearning and whining for yesterday. Life in Babylon was all they knew. And it was its own kind of comfortable. Because it's all they knew. It was its own kind of security. Because it's all they knew. And now they're facing a long trip home. Fraught with peril. And then enemies and a construction project when they get back there. Many of the Jews have become so absorbed in that worldly, glittering, modern life of Babylon, they had lost the vision of themselves as God's chosen people. Now hear me again, I'm not preaching against palaces. Daniel worked in the palace. I'm not preaching against influence. Meshach had influence. And so did Abednego and Shadrach. But they had become so enamored with that temporary world around them. 
I say this before, we write and sing about temporal things and immediate healings and God fixing our current problems. And honey, he can do all that. You bring him to the altar with you this morning. But we sing it today. It's an old song and a throwback. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Why? Because I've got to make it to heaven. I might go divorce. I might go with cancer. I might go with no living heirs. I might go with depression. I might go in poverty. But I understand. Understand, this isn't about a house or a car. This isn't about improving my Tuesday. This is about eternity. Here they are. Those Jews so absorbed with the glitter of Babylon that so many of them had lost their vision of who they were. And if we ever forget where we're going and who we are, then the rest of this is irrelevant. It didn't seem as important for them except for this remnant. So many had no desire to go back and work and fight. They were looking for something easy, for that low-hanging fruit. And apathy had vanquished hope. And now compromise had diluted their lives. Before long, Ezra would discover that this spiritual disease was not just limited to the Jews that stayed back in Babylon and said, yeah, I mean, I believe in God, but I'm not walking to Israel. Oh, I want revival, but I'm not building a wall. Sure, I want the truth restored, but I'm not going to rebuild a temple, man. It's summertime. These others that went back with him, so many of them brought that same spirit. Because that mindset of sin travels. And they return to their homeland. They're in the right place. But they still got a compromised identity. They're back in the land God told them to be in, but their mindset's still a Babylonian mindset. And they're wondering why Israel's not fulfilling when they're really thinking like Persians. Even among those who returned to the promised land, there was still that state of continued broken covenant with God. When Ezra learned this, his heart was broken. He began to intercede for the nation. He travailed before God in a public display, not just of humiliation, but of repentance. He began to cry out to God for behalf, on behalf of his backslidden nation. He began to cry out to God on behalf of the backslidden church of his generation. Not raising to condemn them first, seeking God's help for them first. Don't you ever think that the cry of one righteous person doesn't matter. Don't you? There are times I'm alone in this building and I find a corner and begin to repent for my generation and repent for my city and ask God's mercy. To, that doesn't matter. It mattered when Abraham did it. It mattered when Ezra did it. And it matters when you do it that cry of the intercessor before anybody else was convicted there was one man in a corner crying out on behalf of all of them in repentance and it was in this setting that that, that second eye a representative of the people stood before Ezra and began to repent on behalf of Israel and even as he confronts the fact that they have trespassed against God and he acknowledges the only way back is to come out from among them and reestablish their separation their uniqueness unto God even as he confronts the darkness that has overshadowed them and the grim future that lies ahead hope flutters in the chest and that song begins to creep out you can hear it in his words the situation's bad he starts to repent he starts to lament the circumstances are terrible the cost of their transgression is terrible he said we lost our nation because our great grandfathers married people that God told them to stay away from and now here we are 70 years later just starting to crawl and claw back and we're marrying people that God told us to stay away from yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this yet now a moment ago he's saying there was no hope a month ago there was no hope just a short time ago we were a people undone by our trespasses But now in an atmosphere of repentance, can I tell you, we've got to get back to repentance. God loves you. You don't have to earn that. He loves you. You don't have to measure up to that. 
He doesn't love you because you're gifted or special or beautiful or talented or bright. He just loves you. He, he, he loves you. You Google what that baby looks like right now lately? It's a funny looking thing. You have? Describe it to me. Huh? Shrimp. Yeah, no arms. No legs. It, it, it's got little arms. Oh, it's starting to look like our side of the family. <laughs> no idea what color its hair is going to be. I say it respectfully. Him or her. As long as it's one, I'm good. No idea if it'll be short or tall. It'll be short when it's born. I've, I've, I've read this book. No idea if it'll be gifted in some way or another. You'll think it is either way. If that kid's ugly and without talent, you'll never know. So relax. <laughs> but love for no other reason than it exists. And because they're yours. God loves you so far beyond. What you feel when you held your child in your arms. He loves you beyond what you feel in your heart when your eyes land on your firstborn grandchild. You didn't earn that, honey. He loves you. He loves you. And that hope came from one moment when they began to list their issues. He loves you. Let me tell you how it works if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This new brand of Christianity without repentance will not change your life. This new brand of Christianity without repentance won't get anybody off drugs, anybody off pornography, anybody off alcohol. It won't fix your marriage. But honey, if you'll just fess up to him, not me, him, not them, him. If you'll say I'm a wreck and I'm a sinner and I know it, Hope will come alive in your soul. Yeah. Cost of repentance, it's free, but honey, the cost is high. There's no easy fix. I've got to confess. I can't just explain. Well, God, I shouldn't have to repent. I'm this way because my parents were dingbats. That's, that's not how this works. Dingbats, though, your parents might have been. I'm here, I'm, I'm messed up like this because my siblings were, well, they were all, that, that might be true, but we're talking about you. Not what people put you through, your reaction to what people put you through. It starts with repentance. See, their issues always present themselves as small compromise. We're carried away in Babylon, but come on, we're just, we're just talking about food. How big a deal is this really? Do you think God won't love me just because I don't eat the stuff he told us to eat? Really? Really? I mean, we're talking about God. He knows what's in my heart. Do you think he cares which temple I go to? Really? We're talking about God. Do you, oh, oh, and it just creeped into their life. It wormed its way through the smallest cracks in their convictions. And when it got there, it infected every part of their being. And as foolishly like we all do, they thought they could control it. Kids really shouldn't do this, but it's okay for me. I can control it. New Christians shouldn't do this, but I, I can handle it. I can just lie at work to make the sale and tell the truth everywhere else, but you new people should probably tell the truth all the time. That's not the way it works. What the old timers used to say, sin takes you further than you wanted to go and keeps you longer than you wanted to stay and charges more than you're willing to pay. This dark moment of history and the people of God, they've returned to Bab from Babylon, but honey, they brought Babylon back to Jerusalem with them. They were delivered from the barn, but they brought the bar to church. They were delivered from the cesspool, but they got the cess with them. They've been liberated from political slavery. But now they're still willingly staying in spiritual slavery. Their transgressions were not small. And the damage was not minor. 
There was, their situation was grim. And he opened his mouth to confess. And then he said, there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Oh, those feeble voices in our mind that tell us there's no way back. Those feeble voices in our flesh that say it can never be like it used to be for me. Those bells that ring in the back of our heart. Those satanic mumblings that it's never going to be for me like it used to be for me. The addiction, the mistakes, the brokenness, the disaster. It's taken me too far. You hear me? The devil is a liar. This entire kingdom exists because there is hope in of this. See, Satan can't create anything, so he perverts everything. He perverts everything. He turns love into lust and blessing into bondage and faith into fear. Faith and fear are the same energy. It's like a rope and a tug of war that pulls you in opposite directions. It's almost the same thing, but it runs in another direction. And he is a Liar, when you begin to feel hopelessness welling up in you, I want to tell you, you're in the right place. Jesus met the disciples in Luke chapter 5. They had been fishing all night long and taking nothing. They went back to the boat. The Bible said they're washing their nets. Done. You don't wash your gear until you're through. You, you, you wash your stuff when you're not going to put it back in the water. They're washing their nets and Jesus walks right up. Because he didn't even introduce himself to them until they threw their hands up and said, oh, we're not getting it done. I can't fix it myself you want to change your life this is not the power of positive thinking this isn't you pulling yourself up by the bootstraps this is an American rugged individualism you've got to throw your hands up and admit I've tried it my way for years and I'm an absolute train wreck and God I know that and if you'll help me I want you to hope in spite of of my failures, my bad decisions, my compromises, the inroads of hell in my life, my rotten selfish attitude, my nature, the pain, hurt, and brokenness that I cause or that other people cause for me. There's always hope in spite of this as long as he's alive and loves me and I can turn my heart to him. He'll still leave the 99 and come track you down. He'll reach for you. Everybody under to the sound of my voice you are in the right place now don't get me wrong he's not so desperate for people to help that he'll just overlook me and pretend like it's fine we're not talking about grossing over the wrongs in our life he's not saying well I mean you know sure I'm a drug dealer but God loves drug dealers too I know that I'm a bank robber but God loves bank robbers too listen we're not talking about God tolerating me the way I am. He loves you just like you are. He loves you too much to leave you that way. Right. And if you'll let him, he will change your life completely. Because he doesn't just forgive, he redeems. God can redeem you. And I know that because he redeemed me. I've got to hurry. Wellington famously led his forces against Napoleon at Waterloo. It was the most consequential battle fought for at least 400 years in Europe. And maybe, maybe the most consequential battle, maybe, between the fall of Rome and the Second World War. In 1815, an island empire paused, waiting the results of a clash that would determine whether freedom was on the march in Europe or whether they would have to prepare to defend their own island and homes for the first time in 800 years since the Norman invasion. In 1815, Things didn't travel quite as quickly as they do now. Things have changed. My in-laws were preparing a garage sale and had a typewriter. I think Daniel was 11. He stared mesmerized at this typewriter. And he finally turned to his mom and he said, where's the send button? He knew nothing of stamps, the mail, 
envelopes and could not fathom that there were keys and no way to send the message. Their typewriters didn't text in 1815. They didn't type either. It was a different world. And the only way to bring the news of the battle across the expanse of land to the English Channel and then all the way up the Thames to England, the only way was for the message to be broadcast through the lanterns in the night sky in Morse code. Ships sailed south from Belgium as soon as the issue was decided. Once they landed on the eastern coast of Britain, they began to relay the news through flashing lights from one hilltop to the other all the way to London. A herald awaited atop Winchester Cathedral for news of the battle. And by the time that eagerly awaited message arrived in London, wouldn't you know, as typically does, a dense fog set in. Did you guys get to experience an English fog? Oh, you were cheated. You were cheated. You usually can't see London. If you can see London, you're probably... Anyway, that fog settled in. And moments before the light become obscured, the herald had only made out two words. You've probably heard the story. Wellington defeated, and then fog. He sent the word he had, and panic literally ensued. In a matter of minutes, planning began in earnest for the defense of the island nation. Defeat began to grip a city until a moment of clarity when the entire message came through yet again. Wellington defeated the enemy. There was not another moment like that in London until the Great War, the First World War, ended. And the only other that's rivaled it in living memory is the end of World War II. For a brief moment, all hope was lost. And then clarity came. And they learned that the victory they yearned for had been won the previous afternoon. My soul and the enemy of my soul longs and contrives to deceive me. Because David said it best, O oh, wretched man that I am. I want you to hear me. In those moments where it's all lost, what makes God God is the ability to breathe and the fog roll out just for a second. We have a rendezvous with reality. Now hear me, hear me, I'm done. Saul's pursuing David. He wants to kill him. Saul's in a cave. David had him. He could have taken him. He could have killed him. He could have ordered his men to kill him. He could have ended the manhunt and ended the war, but he didn't do it because he said, I'm not going to murder this man. If God wants him dead, God can do it. We struggle with vengeance. His mind saith the Lord, don't we? Oh, we struggle. And in that moment, when Saul walks out, David comes out behind him and yells, what are you pursuing after? Why are you chasing me? I could have killed you and I didn't. I'm not your enemy. And this fog that had so clouded Saul's brain <clears throat> just cleared for a moment. He had what I call a rendezvous with reality. He said, David, thou art a more righteous man than I, and one day thou shalt surely be king in Israel. Then he asked him, will you spare my children when you come to the throne? Will you spare my grandchildren? And he said, I will. And he packed the army up and he went home. But he didn't make a change. And days later, the fog set back in. And he took himself back into delusion. Let's stand together. Hear me. You're in a place right now where you can have a rendezvous with reality. And honey, the fog doesn't ever have to come back. The fog doesn't ever have to come back. See, the truth is, we're controlled through intimidation, deceit, and our own short-sighted selfishness. 
Brother Moore, I know I need to change, but you just don't understand how hard this is for me to get this thing out of my heart. To get it out of my mind. Oh, how foolish we sound. Jesus exited his ship in the land of the Gadarenes and there was a man there. They had tried to bind him with chains and they couldn't. He's got a legion of demons living inside of him. He's literally unclothed. Here's a naked man living in a cemetery with the legions of demonic spirits in his chest. And when he saw Jesus and decided that he was going to run to him and fall down on his feet and worship him, a literal legion from hell living inside of his body and mind couldn't stop him from doing it. Because, honey, this is how this works. You could be literally devil-possessed today, but there is hope in spite of this. And if you want to get to his feet right now in this building, you! I don't know your story but I know his no idea where you're from I know him my mom hero of mine best attitude of any person I've ever met you just couldn't upset her she had her thyroids removed and when I was a little bitty guy she comes home with this giant cut throat it's kind of scary at the time looked like pirates had taken her shift <laughs> and being mom she's talking about how cool the scar is but nobody else's mom's got a cool scar like that. You lose everything in the house. You're forced to smile on her face. We get to buy all new stuff. She could take dining room chairs and turn them into a train. My mother was magical. I grew up with a Disney character in the house. Not perfect, she's a morning person, but nearly perfect. Everybody's got their flaws. Nobody should wake up singing. If you do, God bless you, and I'm happy for you, and I'm so glad you don't live in my house. I'll never forget when God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I called that godly woman who had taught me the Scripture who was such a better person than I was. And I tried to communicate the biblical reality, but more than that, for me, what happens in your life when God fills you with the Holy Ghost. She was so concerned that you people had brainwashed me, she got on a plane and flew to Mississippi. She staged an intervention. I came home and there's my grandma, my mom, Uncle Larry's pastor of West Back Jackson Baptist Church in Mississippi at that time. My grandpa, he didn't say anything, but he never did, so that wasn't unusual at all. I didn't know he could talk till my grandmother died. She did that for him. He probably said more in between, never mind. She was the spokesman of the group. They did their best to detox me because we were Baptist folks. Some of us were preachers and some of us were, you know, inmates, but we're all Baptist. And had been for 400 years. Her family came from England to start Baptist churches in the colony. Before Napoleon ever came to power. And she's there trying to help me. Believe it or not, at 15, brand new convert, I wasn't the most eloquent spokesman in the world probably could have handled it better but I'll never forget that magic moment way after midnight when the light came on and she saw the biblical reality of what we're talking about 
Now, it was pretty amazing when I got to call my pastor at 3 a.m. and wake him up and ask him to meet her at the church and baptize her because she had a flame to catch. But I'll never forget that realization in her eyes just a short time before. Can I help you? I love God and I was a believer. I was literally in a college for ministers. And when I saw that there was more, it filled my soul with hope. Because I was a believer, but I was a mess. I believed every word, but I knew when I read that book and I looked at my life, the two were not the same. And the greatest day of my life is when I found out, of course, God's real. And of course, the word of God's true. But there's more to this than I have yet received. It filled me with hope. I believed in Him. I loved Him. I never blinked. But honey, when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, it didn't change my world view. It changed my world. It didn't just change the way I felt. It changed the way I thought. It changed the... He can do that for you right now in this building. Right now in this building. Right now in this building. I'm not pretending like your issues aren't real. I'm telling you there's hope in spite of this. I'm not saying you haven't had a raw deal. There's hope in spite of this. Your parents may have been the worst. You may have suffered loss that some of us can't even imagine. But there's a building full of people with their own messed up story who can tell you there is hope on the other side of this. Not because you can do it, but because he'll do it. And he'll do it now. Let's thank him together. Can we do that? Oh, right now, I'm absolutely finished. If you need God to do something in your life, would you just make your way up here and pray with us? It doesn't matter what it is. If you need Him to fill you with the Holy Ghost, if you need a miracle in your body, in your mind, or in your family, if you need deliverance in the mind or in the body, can we just reach up and find a place to talk to Him? I'm not questioning your story. I'm talking about in spite of it. In spite of it. Let's reach for him today. He's real. He's real.